1. We are going to start with a point that we already saw in the previous exhibition, in Ecumene. Because we are going to put into context what geographical knowledge was in Elcano's time. A brief aside, we usually talk about Magellan and Elcano's round-the-world voyage, but Magellan died halfway round the world and was not able to complete the round-the-world voyage, which means that Elcano was the one who really completed the round-the-world voyage. At that time, Columbus and others still carried with them the geographical conceptions of antiquity. Here on the right we have, and I think it is quite illustrative, the size of the earth as considered by the ancients until the Renaissance, which was derived from the measurements made by the Greeks. Eratosthenes made a correct measurement of the circumference of the earth, as seen in the figure on the left. Another Greek geographer, Posidonius, made another indirect measurement and came up with a size that is comparatively the one on the right. This. Much smaller size than the real one is the one that has survived to this day. This is the starting point, the earth was known to be spherical, no doubt about it, but it was a lot bigger than they thought. This is one of the things you will discover on the Pacific voyage. 2. The official image was that of Ptolemy's geography. A world rather more extended in length, where obviously there was no America and also the Indian Ocean was considered to be an enclosed lake. Here is a facsimile that we also had on display at Ecumene, where you can see the Ptolemaic map Mundi in a perfect facsimile manuscript with its miniatures in gold, imitating parchment, etc., of one preserved in the Vatican Library, from around 1470. This is the world of the official, somewhat archaic geographical image that existed until the time of Columbus. There is an important milestone, Columbus arrives in America without knowing that he has arrived in America precisely because of this. According to his calculations, with the smaller circumference of the earth than the real one shown on Ptolemy's map, he has traveled a distance that allows him to deduce that he has reached the coasts of Asia. That is why they call him that, because he was looking for the Indies, as a vague, abstract place, from where some of the most expensive products of the time, including spices, arrived commercially. We shall see, but this first round-the-world voyage was neither intended to circumnavigate the world nor was it a voyage of exploration and conquest, but simply to reach the source of the spice in order to avoid intermediaries or to upset the monopoly that the Portuguese had achieved, as we shall see later. 3. Well, this is the letter of Juan de la Cosa, the original of which is in the Naval Museum in Madrid. The coasts of the Iberian Peninsula, Europe, Africa can be seen here, and it is the first one in which America is represented. It is from the year 1500 and we put it here as a previous context. It shows the Gulf of Mexico and the islands of Cuba and the Dominican Republic and Haiti. At this point, it is unclear what passes through the ends of the map, whether they overlap or not. America has been reached, but the ends of the world are not known, they even think, Columbus among them, that the Indies have been reached. From this discovery, the King of Portugal claimed his part in all this and the Treaty of Tordesillas was signed. What the Treaty of Tordesillas did was to draw a line 370 leagues west of the Cape Verde archipelago, and whatever remained to the east of that line would belong to Portugal for the purposes of exploration and whatever remained to the west to Spain. At the time they didn't know where the Antimeridian was going, they didn't care much, but that will be the problem when the Moluccas. 4. This is a facsimile replica of the Tordesillas Treaty that is made as the contracts nowadays, a contract of Arras. Two copies were made, one in Portuguese, signed with King John of Portugal, and another in Castilian, Don Fernando and Dona Isabel, and they were exchanged with their corresponding lead seals. And in this regard, there is a curious quote attributed to contemporary King of France which says, show me the clause in Adam's will by which he divides the world between Spaniards and Portuguese. Which is to say, and why did you divide up the world without counting on anyone? Well, let's say you had the support of the Pope at that time, who was Spanish and who swept the carpet a bit. But indeed, between the two great Iberian powers at the time, they decided to divide the world in half, like an orange cut in half for exploration purposes. 
5. Related to this is the Cantino chart, named after the author, dated around 1502. It is a royal census, that is to say, the image of the known world, Portuguese, including America, and it is important because it is the first map, or the earliest known map, with the line of the Treaty of Tordesillas drawn on it. The initial agreement was about 100 leagues to the west, and the Portuguese, who surely knew more than history has left, knew the distance to America and said, no, don't take it any further that way because what I want is to take something from these new lands that have been discovered, which have effectively become today's Brazil. It is no coincidence that Portuguese is spoken in Brazil, and all this derives from here, from this area of Portuguese influence. 6. We are going to take another important step, which we have already seen in the ecumenical exhibition, which is when we realize that what has been discovered is a new continent and not part of Asia. Around 1503, Amerigo Vespux's nautical chart Mundus Novus was published, in which he, claiming to have sailed for the Spanish and Portuguese, says that the lands he has traveled through, the presumed Indians, cannot be the Indians, because they have a very great extension are as populated as are Asia, Europe and Africa, he says it is a new world, etc. A printed version of that letter reaches the cartographer who made this map, Martin Wald Seemuller. This is one of the most important maps in history. It is a woodcut mural, i.e. with the plates carved in wood, distributed on 12 sheets. Only one copy remains, although it is known that 1,000 printed copies were made and it is in the Library of Congress. They call him the birth certificate of America and hold him in high esteem. Why? Because. Wald Seemuller, on reading America's accounts, mistakenly interpreted that he was the one who had discovered this Mundus Novus, this new world. He called it America in an accompanying text, in honor of Amerigo, its illustrious discoverer. He calls this new continent America, he depicts it on this map and this is the origin of America's name today. Only this copy remains, although another may appear, as there were more copies. Important, America appears for the first time, separated from Asia by a still unnamed ocean, Japan is also shown. Graphically, this marks the transition from ancient to modern geography. It represents the first double hemisphere map. By the way, we have an exhibition at the IGN headquarters on dual hemisphere maps starting here. Because the ancient world, that of Claudius Ptolemy, the Alexandrian cosmographer, no longer fits into the traditional model of the medieval circular world map. So there is another hemisphere, that of Amerigo Vespucci, where America appears. Japan shows how wrong the concept of the size of the world still was, because it is practically next to the coast of America. America, but still this is a fundamental step in knowing what the structure of the world is already like. 7. Let's take a look at the key players in this feat, Fernando or Hernando de Mogollones, Portuguese, who served his country for many years and even became lame and was not rewarded as he thought he would be leading to conflicts with the King of Portugal, for which he offered his services to Spain and the plan to reach the Spices, however, as we know, he died halfway through the voyage. Elcano, a native of Gataria. This is a view of Gataria, from Teixeira's Atlas of 1634. Anyone who has been there can perfectly identify the mouse of Gataria, the port, etc., and on the page next to it is Zumaya. It is a description of all the coasts of the peninsula, precisely for military purposes. Antonio Pigafetta, the chronicler. Thanks to him, much is known about the expedition. Pigafetta had no known job, he was what in those days was called a outstanding, that is, a guy without a job who joined the expedition because he had time, leisure, and some influence. Thanks to the fact that he was unemployed, he was able to devote himself to making the newspaper and instead of being an artillery man, a cooper, a barber, i.e. a surgeon, or a sailor, like others, he was an A. He was also a very close and loyal friend of Magellan. In fact, in Pigafetta's account it is curious but Ilcano is not mentioned even once, 
despite the fact that he was the one who led the ship back, possibly because he was one of the rebels and because of enmity. 8. On the other side we have other characters, King Charles, his brother-in-law King John of Portugal, Rui Faleiro, the cosmographer who planned this voyage, and a map from the 17th century, 1616, of the Cantabrian coast, entitled Legionis Biscaya Gipuscoi Typus, that is, a map of the regions of Leon, Vicaya, and Gipuzkoa. And here the curiosity is that in the area of Gipuzkoa there is a place name, Elcano, which also eclipses Gataria. Well, there is a curious story about this, Elcano is a small town of three or four hamlets and a chapel and it is not important enough to appear on this map or on a map of the peninsula or anything else. However, after the round the world voyage, it became relevant and a Dutch cartographer, Ortelius, ended up representing Elcano and erasing Deteria, which is next to it and is the important port. And this is prolonged in such a way that Elcano continues to appear as an important town when in fact there are only three or four hamlets. 9. So let's move on to the cartographic image in the other room. This is another large wall map by the same German author from 1516, the other one was from 1507, which is basically the printed version of a royal Portuguese census. If you look at it and go back, it looks very much like the Cantino chart, where the meridian of Tordesillas appears, it is practically a printed copy of a royal register. Here, Wald Seemuller, already aware that he had made a mistake, does not use the name America again and in fact, he only used that name once and quickly corrected the mistake, but the name endured because of how popular it became. What do we see here? A map of the world entitled Carta Marina Navigatoria Portugal N Navigations. And among other things, to the south of the African coast appears King Manuel with a scepter, a Christian cross and the Portuguese flag, as an allegory of the dominion that the Portuguese had over this route. Why? Because in 1498, the Portuguese reached India by rounding the Cape of Good Hope, thus reaching the origin of pepper. It's as simple as that, as silly as it sounds, pepper is a pretty affordable thing today, but they became the first to bring these spices without intermediaries, by sea. There was a Turkish blockade of the Mediterranean that prevented everything coming from the east from reaching the then very rich Mediterranean republics like Venice, Genoa, Pisa, and so on, which monopolized trade in the Mediterranean. Then the Turks cut this off, a large amount of taxes were levied and the Portuguese said, well, we have to look for another route. This is what made them follow this route for almost 100 years until they reached the Malabar coast, where the pepper originated. At that time, the Portuguese dominated this route and the King of Spain wanted to reach the same side but, by virtue of the Treaty of Tordesillas, he could not follow this route because it was forbidden, as there was a line that said, this is for the Portuguese. So you have to look for the route to the west, which is one of the things Columbus tried, obviously he didn't succeed and that is the aim of this voyage. Curiosities in South America there is a typical cannibal scene of the time. They are making a human barbecue with arms and legs. The legend of the cannibals in South America, which by the way was real, appears a lot on these maps because it's a very striking thing. What is this that we see here, which occupies almost one of the woodcut sheets? Well, to show the importance of spices in 1516, the Portuguese arrived in the Moluccas in 1512 following this route. It is a list of the prices of spices in the market of Calicut, and where it comes from. Nutmeg is worth so much, cloves are worth so much, ginger is worth so much. Everything that is now affordable is listed where it comes from and how much it costs. You can see that, indeed, one of the most expensive is the clove, which only grew in a small archipelago of very few, very small, volcanic islands which were precisely the Moluccas. All attempts to transplant in the past failed. When the Dutch arrived there, they raised everything to the ground and forbade, on pain of death, to take a clove plant out of there, because it would ruin their monopoly. 10. So, let's move on to the background before the start of the trip. We continue with the image. Before the voyage. 
This one above is a Portuguese nautical chart of the Indian Ocean from 1517, in which you can see first of all that the Portuguese already knew it and it perfectly reflects the route followed by the Portuguese to get to the Moluccas beforehand, which is by skirting the entire African coast, all this for years, to reach the coast of Melinda, to jump the Indian Ocean and everything we see here, labeled with place names. That's the only part they knew, where the spices came from. And in 1512 they arrive in the Moluccas and they map exactly what is of interest to them. And this would be the first regional map of a large area where the Moluccas appear. It was a very big state secret. This one below is by a son of this cartographer, Jorge Reinal, and in 1519 he made this chart just before the voyage. He was hired in Spain by King Charles. This royal register, you can see the structure it has, is divided in half, this would be the line of the Treaty of Tordesillas, with the part that belongs to Spain and the part that belongs to Portugal with the Castilian and Portuguese flags. And here is a curiosity, it is made by a Portuguese cartographer who has deserted, in inverted commas, to work for the King of Spain and places the Moluccas, unknown to the Spanish, here, with a legend that says, this is the island of Maluco, where the nail comes from. And with political intent, since he was going to work for Spain, what he did was to place them in the Spanish hemisphere, and this is the debate, are the Moluccas on this side of the line or the other? Depending on this uncertainty, a lot of money was at stake at the time, in other words, the maximum wealth available at the time. Well, we are now past 1519. This is the image that was held at the court of King Charles of what the world was like as far as it was known, as far as the Rio de la Plata. The previous expedition had gone as far as the Rio de la Plata and from there it was unknown. Magellan's aim, and this is the plan that brought him here, was to find the passage across the American continent, which was considered an obstacle, so to speak, to reach the spice. At that time, no one saw America as a source of wealth, gold and silver would come later, but as a gigantic obstacle that prevented them from reaching the Moluccas. Magellan, who had Portuguese information, said, I know where the pass is. Antonio Pigafetta, the chronicler, wrote a diary of the voyage which can be downloaded on the internet. It is a simple and rather curious book, and in it the chronicler says that Magellan knew that it was necessary to pass through a very hidden strait that he had seen depicted on a map that the king of Portugal kept in his treasury, built by Martin of Bohemia, a very excellent cosmographer. 11. Magellan thought he had seen a pass, but in reality his erroneous information probably came from this balloon that Johannes Schona mistakenly, and from a misunderstood Portuguese account, thought that there was a pass more or less at the height of the Rio de la Plata. The Rio de la Plata was one of the areas that the expedition mistook for the pass because of its width. 200 kilometers, as they were still sailing and there was salt water. Until they go upstream and realize that there is fresh water, and they say, this can't be the pass. And they sail painfully on until they reach the South American coast again. 12. More image before or just after 1519. There is an atlas, the Miller Atlas, given by King Manuel I of Portugal to King Charles on the occasion of his marriage to his sister Isabella of Portugal, which seems to have been made with the intention of confusing his brother-in-law, the King of Spain. It was a very luxurious gift. All the nautical charts are very correct and there are only two or three that have information that in some cases is even nonsensical. In 1519 this picture of the world was impossible at the Portuguese court. Because it is a medieval world map where the Indian Ocean effectively appears as a closed ocean. One theory is that if it reached King Charles it would discourage him from taking the new route, because there was no passage anywhere. Therefore, this is a map made with presumably political intent. Evidently, it is a crude composition, it was impossible for them to think this at the Portuguese court. And here there is a quote after the voyage, but which gives an idea of the rivalry of that. Time, from the Spanish ambassador in Portugal who writes to the king saying, I have learned that certain Portuguese pilots have had and have the charge and are currently working on it of changing the navigation charts they have for India, cutting a lot of road, 
so that the Maluko would remain in their part. What does this say? We know that the Portuguese falsify their charts, we know that they intentionally filter them with incorrect information and what they do is shorten the sailing distance to the Maluko so that it comes to the Portuguese side, thus claiming possession of those islands. Because the problem at that time was that geographical longitude, i.e. the time difference, was very difficult to measure, there were no instruments until the chronometer appeared. So there was a zone of uncertainty of thousands of kilometers and, lo and behold, the Malakas were in that zone. So nobody knew how to do that. Later, when the Spice fleet arrived there, the two kings of Spain and Portugal reached an agreement in 1529. What the king of Spain did was to say, I pledge the Malakas to you, that is, I lend them to you for the time being, until it can be decided who owns them and in exchange I ask for 350,000 ducats of gold, an exorbitant amount. And, well, the point is that the Malakas were actually on the Portuguese side, so he sold them something that was already on their side and also, evidently, never claimed it and was of no use to them. Not only that, but the Portuguese, a few decades later, were expelled by the Dutch, which also put them out of business. 13. Here are some preparatory documents from the Navy. A lot of documentation from that period is preserved in the archive of the Indies, and these are some curious ones. For example, a facsimile of the list of crew members, la relation de gent en las neos q su alteza manda en via al descubrimento de la especiaria, q ha por capitan mea Fernando de Mogollones, and this is one of the sheets. And the captain Hernando de Mogollones appears on the ship Trinidad. We have pointed it out here because the calligraphy is difficult. Elcano and Gaspar de Quesada, one of the executed, condemned to death for the mutiny that took place in San Julian, also appear. There is another list of salaries, according to the position of each person. In this case, Juan Sebastian Elcano, resident of Bateria, son of such and such, a salary of X, salaries collected half yearly and in advance. Why? Well, because they were not fools and most of them, as happened, did not return or knew they would not return. So the wages stayed here, to their heirs. Out of a total of approximately 250 crew members who left Seville in five ships, only 18 returned with the NAO Victoria and only one ship out of five. If they had known, surely many would not have enlisted. But that gives an idea of the difficulty of the voyages at that time. In three years practically all of them died, some deserted, others were taken prisoner by the Portuguese and returned in a trickle during the following years. There are also the capitulations, the contract between the king with Hernando de Magellan and his partner, Rui Falero, who has been somewhat obscured by history, but who was the cosmographer who told Magellan, according to my calculations, which were incorrect, the Moluccas are on the Spanish side, so claim it, go with this plan to the king of Spain and let him hire you. Magellan was not listened to in Portugal, he was despised even though he was Portuguese, he was very angry and offered his services to King Charles. In the list of the cost of the Armada they had everything in a perfect list with everything they were carrying, goods, food, food, and a big item was the objects they were carrying to trade. Spices, beads, cloths, I don't know. What, to exchange for spices or whatever they found? And in this respect it's funny that Westerners are usually accused of trying to cheat the Indians by giving them rags and mirrors in exchange for valuable things, although it was exactly the same in reverse, they bring us some mirrors, some knives, which are very valuable for a thing that grows on trees that we don't want at all. In other words, the concept was mutual, who would sell the other a thing that had no value for him in exchange for something that did have value. 14. The Ports of Departure Seville is where all the expeditions have been prepared since the Casa de Contratation was created, as the monopoly is there. And this is a modern reproduction of what Seville was like in 1519 and, in fact, you can see the Guadalquava, the Triana Bridge, the Cathedral, the Dockyards, the Suburbs, etc. And moored in the Guadalquava, ships from the Indies race. From here they all left by monopoly. And here is a quote from Pigafetta. On the 10th of August, 19, 
the day of San Lorenzo. The Armada left Seville, which is not a seaport but a river port, and then there was a 40 to 50 kilometers journey along the Guadalquivir to reach San Luca, the place of departure. 15. This other one is a view from 1588, from an album of the first Atlas of Cities, the Civitatis Orbis Terrorum of Seville. This is a reproduction, but in this one on the right, which is more or less from that period, you can see the same elements and you can see how there are indeed a lot of ships moored in the Guadalquivir getting ready to leave. In fact, the gold tower appears here, which is still there today, it was where the crane was located where the goods were loaded in the port of Las Muelas which usually appears in all the drawings of that time, and that is a view of San Luca. There is a local or regional rivalry between San Luca and Seville because both say, each with good reason, that it is the place where the expedition left from. It really left from Seville, but it is true that it set sail from San Luca de Barrameda. Well, you can see the ships of the Spice Expedition on their way to San Luca de Barrameda. 16. This is a map of Andalusia by Ortelius from 1579. Seville is shown here, and the Guadalquivir River would lead down to the Atlantic. And this other one is the map of the African coast and the Canary Islands, also by Ortelius from more or less the same period, at the end of the 16th century, where the Canary Islands are shown because all the expeditions of the Indies race always stopped in the Canary Islands. They took the opportunity to collect water, food, enlist some more sailors, make repairs, whatever. In this case, they made a technical stop in Tenerife and were slow to leave because rumours had reached them that the King of Portugal had planned to intercept the fleet, knowing that there was an expedition to reach the Moluccas, which he considered his own. So they stood there waiting for news. 17. This 1927 globe shows the ocean currents very well. The fact is that navigation at that time was totally conditioned by the direction of the currents and winds. Due to a physical effect caused by the Earth's rotation, called the Coriolis effect, ocean currents and air masses generally move clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. What does this mean? That if we throw a cork in the Canary Islands, it will surely reach America on its own. What is not so easy is for him to return because we have to find the return route. What did the Portuguese do to reach India? First they spent almost 100 years, little by little, coasting along the African coast. And up to the equator they did very well, dragged by favorable winds and currents. When they crossed the equator they had them in the opposite direction. In 1500 they realized that if they went down here, further away from the coast, they crossed the equator and joined this current. Although they traveled a much longer distance, they arrived faster. This is what the Portuguese called La Volta do Mar. And to return, they did the same thing in the opposite direction, going around the Atlantic and passing through the Azores, which was a common place to pass through. This is a curiosity. In the case of the Pacific, the return route was not known, a similar scheme is intuited and, in fact, since the expedition of Magellan and Elcano arrived in the Moluccas, it took four or five voyages organized by the kings of Spain to be able to return and they did not succeed because they could not find the return voyage. Until, in 1565, the Legazpi and Erdanita expedition, especially Erdanita, on their return, actually found the current that led back to Mexico, heading north. To cross America, the Strait of Magellan was abandoned, because it was quite dangerous and impracticable, and they began to pass through the Isthmus of Panama. 18. Well, so far we have seen that they cross the Atlantic, reach America, and spend a long time, little by little, in every important inlet they see, looking for a passage. They anchor in the Rio de la Plata, keep moving forward, and a mutiny takes place in San Julian. The crews are tired of Magellan not explaining anything and even fear that there is going to be a betrayal on the high seas and, with tempers running high, almost as soon as they reach the strait, a mutiny breaks out. This mutiny was quickly put down by Magellan, who sentenced many to death, so many that he had to pardon them, because if he had executed all those he had condemned, he would not have been able to continue. So he pardoned many, including Elcano, who was one of the rebels. 
and a few others, the ringleaders, he executed some of them and abandoned a couple of them in Patagonia, which was the same as condemning them to death. These are nautical atlases with Portuguese information. In this case, this one on the left, as we can see, is oriented to the south, the Strait of Magellan is there, they are obviously after the voyage. The curiosity is that Europeans are seen offering mirrors, metal tools, a dog, to trade with the natives who offer them Palo de Brazil, that is, a wood from which the red dye is obtained. And that's why they call it Brazil, because of the color of the ember, and that was the main wealth that the Portuguese obtained from Brazil, which wasn't much either. You can see exotic animals, in short, a picture of local customs in this highly decorated atlas. And this one on the right is another atlas, also of the American coast, up to the Strait of Magellan. And here we see curious scenes, such as the legend of the Patagonian giants, which was born on this trip. Pigafetta and others relate that they encountered giants in Patagonia and that they called them Patagones after some accounts of a mythical figure of a giant by that name. It is true that the Indians of that place are quite tall and must have been at that time. And of course, the Europeans of that time, who were probably 1.50-1.60m tall, when they met a guy of 1.902m, they thought he was a giant. In fact, no one has ever denied this, although no remains of giants have ever been found. Evidently, they were not giants, they were very tall people. Pigafetta quotes, as we were moving away from these islands, one day when we least expected it, a man of gigantic stature appeared before us, so tall that with his head we could barely reach his waist. Our captain gave this town the name of Patagones. That is where the name Patagonia comes from. Incidentally, proof that they were not lying is that they embarked two or three of them as an example to bring them back to Spain and show them off with such bad luck that evidently the mortality rate was very high and the first to die at the first sign of change were the Patagonians, who were obviously not so used to a ship, on a voyage of this kind. In other words, none of them came back to find out if they were indeed giants or not. Well, back to the other room. 19. They finally reached the Strait of Magellan and a desertion took place there. Shortly before reaching the strait, one of the five ships, the Santiago, crashed, they managed to rescue the goods, and so on. In the strait, as it has so many nooks and crannies, Magellan sends the ships through the forks to look for passage and one of them, the San Antonio, deserts and returns to Spain. He arrives before the others and tells the partial story that Magellan is a tyrant, that he has killed the king's representatives. Magellan's family falls into disgrace. His wife dies ruined, he has a son who also dies, newly born, and so on. Without knowing that a year and a bit later they would arrive, because they thought that with the hardships they were going through and the route they were following, they wouldn't return by any chance, but they did return. And indeed, when the expedition returned with the Victoria, the tables were turned. The other witness arrived and those who were imprisoned were those of the San Antonio, who were free. This is a Portuguese chart from the 16th century, it is a reproduction of a very luxurious chart, miniature in gold, etc., where you can see the Strait of Magellan. And a curious thing, at that time the strait was known, but not what was further south, and it was still thought, for almost 100 years, that there was a large southern continent, as can be seen in the later map of Ortelius that we will see later. This remained the case until 1616. 20, more up-to-date map of the Strait of Magellan and Tierra del Fuego, dated 1640. The map is Dutch. It was the Dutch who rounded Cape Horn, because the route through the Strait of Magellan was very difficult, full of dangers and shipwrecks, and they tried to find an easier route. In any case, it was not a very suitable route for trade. When the Spaniards discovered the return trip, what they did was to reach the Philippines and return to Mexico, cross the Isthmus of Panama on land with the goods and continue across the Atlantic instead of turning back through the Strait of Magellan. 21. Here is Pigafetta's quote, On Wednesday the 28th of November, 1520 we left that strait and plunged into the sea, to which we immediately gave the name Pacific. 
In these three months and 20 days we covered nearly 4,000 leagues of the Pacific Sea in one single route, very peaceful indeed, for in so long a time we did not even meet a school. They misnamed the Pacific Ocean the Pacific Ocean because, to their misfortune, they did not encounter any schools or winds and, in fact, there was significant mortality in the Pacific crossing due to equatorial calms. The Pacific Ocean, as we know, is not as peaceful as they put it here, but this is where it was christened as such. And precisely this map of America, by Munster in 1540, is one of the first to call it Mare Pacificum. The name it had before was the South Sea, the one cited by Nunez de Balboa in 1513 from the Isthmus of Panama. More curiosities, there is a drawing of a ship, the Victoria, another cannibal barbecue which is a common motif. As in a previous map, where they were roasting a person over a fire who was skewered on a stick and they were twirling him around to eat him. 22. This map is a very typical, iconographic map of expeditions. It is the first map of the Pacific, from 1589, by the cartographer Ortelius. Here, in the south, it says Tierra Austral or Magellanic Land, not yet known. And this is an engraving of the ship Victoria where it says, Prima ego velivosis ambivi cursivus album. It is a poem that became famous, it says more or less, I was the first to circumnavigate the world under sail, the ship Victoria is supposed to be speaking, driven under your captaincy, Magellan, through a new strait. I circumnavigated the world and therefore I am deservedly called Victoria. The sails are my wings, my reward, glory. My struggle is with the sea. This is the engraving most likely made by someone who has never been on a boat before, because the sails are blown into the wind and the pennants are going in the opposite direction. If the wind is pushing the sails, the pennants should go forward as well. Obviously he didn't have to know that, because he was a draftsman, an engraver. 23. Map of the world with the image after the voyage, also by Munster, where you can see the Strait of Magellan and where they thought there might be a northwest passage. In fact, for the north of America it says, through this strait opens a way to the Moluccas. There was no such northwest passage. Curiosities, the Pacific Sea and how to Mistitan, i.e. Mexico, is next to Sapango, which was Japan, the name given by Marco Polo. Why? Because this is the image of the commercial maps, the one that reached the general public with decades of delay. The correct image and dimensions were handled in the courts, they were top secret and, specifically in Portugal, at that time, it was punishable by death to leak this information, officially, then they turned a blind eye. This is the image that arrived distorted, with still small dimensions of the world, where Asia meets America. 24. We continue to move forward. Before reaching the Moluccas, the expedition reached the Mariana Islands first, then the Philippines. And Magellan dies in a very foolish encounter against Indians that was not necessary, but he wanted to make a very unequal show of force. And relying on his artillery, which the others knew about and were afraid of, he faced a group of Indians who were greatly outnumbered and killed him there. Then, the expedition is cut off just before reaching the Moluccas, which was their great plan and their great voyage. He died shortly before and as another of the chroniclers, Maximilian Transilvano, a later chronicler who was not on the voyage, says, eight months after Magellan died, they discovered in the month of November 1521 the Moluccas Islands, where the very source of the spices, which they greatly desired, is located. After Magellan's death comes the betrayal of Cebu, where a local chieftain invites them all to a dinner, sets a trap for them and 26 of them are murdered, all the leaders of the expedition. They have no people to govern the three remaining ships and decide to burn one of them, the Concepcion, which was also affected by the Broma, a xylophagus mollusk that deteriorates wood. So they burn it and two ships are left which are the ones that reach Tidal. 25. After that, they spent several months navigating the maze of islands. The Moluccas didn't know where they were, so much so that in the end they literally kidnapped local native pilots and told them, take me to the Moluccas, yes or yes. To the Spice Islands, by force, 
and they arrived in the Moluccas where they were looking for this, the clove. Cloves were, along with pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg and ginger, very expensive commodities. In particular, cloves were only produced on five very small islands, at the other end of the world, unknown, which were the Moluccas, and even if you knew where they were, they were difficult to find. And nutmeg grew a few hundred kilometers away, in another tiny archipelago called Banda. Nowhere else was it naturalized, and it remained so for several centuries, until a French botanist managed to steal some seeds and plants and cultivate them on the island of Mauritius. Since then, it has been available at affordable prices in supermarkets. Well, these are examples of what they were looking for. The cloves, if you look closer you will see that they have a very strong smell. All this stuff was arriving in good condition after years of travel, not exactly fresh goods. And a curiosity, the coat of arms that the king awarded to Elcano for his feet surely many know this, it has a globe with the motto Prima Circum Disti Me, you were the first to turn me around, speaks the earth. But here, in the central part of the coat of arms, is the important part, two cinnamon sticks, three walnuts and twelve cloves. This is a detail that people don't realize, this is what the king appreciated about the spice voyage. The round the world trip and all that was all very well, but what he really appreciated was the commercial interest. 26. Before reaching the Moluccas, Pigafetta says, the Portuguese have said that the Moluccas are located in the middle of an impassable sea because of the shallows and the foggy atmosphere. However, we found the opposite to be true, we never found less than 100 fathoms of water. Among the disinformation leaked by the Portuguese was that it was a very dangerous sea, very difficult and that there were shallows and ships were wrecked. So much so that we have mentioned that misleading circular world map of the Miller Atlas. This is the other map in the Miller Atlas that does not correspond to reality and, not by chance, it is of the Moluccas, which are shown here with a Portuguese flag. The Portuguese cartographer, on a poisoned map for others to see, draws an impracticable labyrinth of islands. A belt of shallows, precisely where the Spaniards were supposed to come from, from the west end, as if that were not enough, a non-existent continent that closes off. The route, the access from the west. This map, I insist, for people who knew the Moluccas for eight years, is nonsense. But it is not nonsense, it is intentionally made, most certainly, to confuse. What the Spanish ambassador had already warned about, Pigafetta says again, we have arrived and what the Portuguese were saying is not true. In other words, it is not impracticable or anything like that. And this is a Dutch map, by Johannes Jansonius, from 1653, where, for the first time, the Moluccan Islands appear on a large scale. And they are these five, Ternate, Tidal, which is where the Spaniards arrived, Muta, Makian and Barkian. Well, there is also this other one, the island of Jalolo, which is a larger island, but it was on these first volcanic islands that the cloves grew. This was the source of military disputes between the Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch and English for more than a century. 27. We keep going, they reach the Moluccas, they are very briefly. In distance it is half the journey. Only two ships reach the Moluccas, we have seen that the Santiago crashes, the San Antonio deserts and the Concepcion is burned. When they arrive in Tidal they start doing business. They carry cloves and a westerner is already swarming around. They meet a Portuguese who, because of the comings and goings of the Malays, tells them, you should know that the Portuguese know you are here, they are building a fleet to come here. So they quickly, in little more than a month, stocked up on cloves and left in a hurry before the Portuguese armada arrived. And it was at that moment that the round-the-world voyage really took shape, because until then it had been a commercial voyage with instructions to go to the Pacific and return via the same place so as not to interfere in Portuguese domains or have conflicts between brothers-in-law. When the two remaining ships, the Trinity and the Victory, are about to leave, they realize that the Trinity is in trouble. They had to leave her to be repaired and at that moment Ilcano allegedly said to the pilot of the Trinidad, you will see what you do. When you fix it, 
you try the return voyage where the king has said, and I'll take the Portuguese route, which they do every year, it's well known and at least they get there. It's illegal, if they catch us, they'll arrest us, the penalties will be severe, but we'll take the Portuguese route. 28, and this much larger reproduction of the painting by Ferdelmore for the Naval Museum illustrates the moment when the crew of the Victoria, including Elcano, bid farewell to the crew of the Trinidad and say, we are leaving. They would not see each other again because the Trinidad, after repairs, tried to return through the Pacific, found neither favorable winds nor currents, and had to return to the Moluccas in a pitiful and moribund state. Not only that, when she arrived she found Portuguese waiting, so they surrendered. Most of them died and some returned after being imprisoned. 29. Elcano arrived in Seville with those 18 crew members and a few Indians who had embarked voluntarily, one of whom is reflected here in the painting, by the way. Then Elcano, without getting off the ship, sent a letter to the king telling him what he had done, that he had reached the spice store, I don't know what, and he also said, remember that you have 13 of your people in Cape Verde, that we left them a few weeks ago, and intercede with your brother-in-law, the king of Portugal, to free them. He did indeed release them weeks or months later. He also recommended that they set up the spice trading house in La Corona so that, if they managed to consolidate this route, they could establish it as a base for negotiating spices. Firstly, to take away Seville's monopoly and secondly, with the excuse that it was closer to the ports of northern Europe, such as Antwerp, where most spices were traded. In the end there was no such contracting house because all subsequent trips to the Moluccas were disastrous. And at the end of the letter, a curious quotation, he tells him all that they have achieved, like the nail, and states, but your majesty will know that what we should esteem and hold most dear is that we have discovered and gone round the whole round of the world, that going to the west we have returned through the east. In other words, bear in mind that we have completed the journey and that is why he gives him this coat of arms, and also the important thing is that we have gone round the world. 30. After the journey, the updated royal registers appeared. The royal register was a copy of the official and secret map that was only known in the courts. With one exception, the Portuguese were very jealous, however, King Charles, or the Emperor, even at that time, when this information and mapping of the Moluccas arrived, as they were debating who they belonged to, was dedicated to handing out royal lists as gifts to all the leaders in Europe as a political claim. What he does is to put the Moluccas on the Spanish side, even with elusive legends. Like this one by Vespuccio, which is very illustrative. It is from 1526, it is in the Hispanic Society of New York, made by Giovanni or Juan Vespuccio, nephew of the famous Amerigo. In it we can see the structure of the royal standard, line of tordesillas, Portuguese flags, Castilian flags, and the Moluccas with a legend that says, Island of Jilolo and Maluco, where the spice and cloves of the King of Castile are born. In other words, in case it is not clear, I put it here and furthermore, that it belongs to the King of Castile. A curiosity, it puts San Anton straight which was discovered by Hernando de Mogollones, probably by the San Antonio, which deserted. The map has more than 360 degrees, it overlaps, the Moluccas are on the Castilian side but, just in case it is not clear, they are drawn again on the other side, again with a Castilian flag. It goes round and round with the same legend, in case anyone has not interpreted graphically what is being claimed here. As we can see, the padrones are also a political weapon. 31. We have a model of the Victoria, we brought it with us, we had never exhibited it before. Well, there are no plans from that period, these models are made on the assumption of what the ships were like at that time and according to their tonnage. A life-size replica has been circulating in Seville and other ports. You just have to imagine what it must have been like to be stuck there for three years, with 50 others, with bad water, no food. That's why only 18 men returned. And on the other side, the model of the training ship Juan Sebastian Elcano in honor of Elcano, which has been loaned to us for the exhibition. 32. More Royal Census. This one is from 1529, by Rivero. 
it is a slightly smaller copy than the original. Knowledge was advancing, and in a few years South America 